Father, we thank you for your word today that is alive, that is about to speak to us right now. Prepare our hearts, God. God, we don't turn off this atmosphere and this anointing. As a matter of fact, we realize that it's catapulting us into the Holy of Holies. And there your word really comes alive. So, Father, as we begin to study your word today and we preach the good news, we ask that our hearts would come alive, that our spirits would be stirred, that our eyes and our ears would be opened. And, God, that you would forever change us. She would forever change us in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We're going to end today's sermon, I'm pretty sure, unless the Spirit leads us in a different direction with more worship. We're not done. As a church, we can't see our worship and the ministry of the Word as two separate things one leads into the other. So I'm going to ask that you guys on the keys keep playing and we're going to minister the word of the Lord today. Singers, I'm going to ask you guys and musicians just to be on standby back here backstage and you guys may be seated here today. I didn't tell our teams that we're going to go right to the word of the Lord, but if they can help me out here with the uh, PowerPoint. We're going to study the word of the Lord today, and God is going to set us free. He's going to do something amazing in this place today. We thank God for it. Anybody ready for the ministry of the word today? Anybody's heart stirred to know that God is in this room, he is in this place? As you know, we've been studying the Lord's Prayer, and I'm going to switch to a different microphone real quick if you guys can help me out. We have been studying the Lord's Prayer over the last several weeks series inside of a series we've called it as we've been studying the Sermon on the Mount those three chapters in Matthew 5 6 and 7 contain so many things that are vital to our walk with the Lord we start off with the Beatitudes we've looked at the concept of the reward from heaven about not making our treasure here on earth but instead up in heaven we talked about the reward of heaven Next week, we'll continue on into chapter 7, some amazing things that God is going to teach us there. But today, we conclude the section on the Lord's Prayer. Verse 13 of Matthew 6 says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to focus today on this section that says, but deliver us from evil. Last week we looked at that first phrase, and lead us not into temptation. And on the, way, and on the one hand, these are two separate thoughts. The idea of temptation, and secondly, the idea of fighting evil. But yet on the other hand, these things go one right with the other. It's one complete thought, as well as a separate thought in and of its own. Today, I want to speak to you on the subject, deliver us, deliver us. So as we look at Matthew 6, 13, we see this phrase, but deliver us from evil. How many know it's okay to smile in God's presence? It's okay to laugh in God's presence. So I'm reminded of a, of a, of a story that I've heard from the time I was a little kid. It cracks me up every time I hear it. This little boy comes home from school, and he's sopping wet. Mom says, Johnny, why are you completely wet? He said, well, Mom, on my way home from school, I go by this swimming pool, and I see that water, and I'm so hot, and it's been a long day at school, and I just can't help myself, so I just jump in. Why do you do that? I'm sorry, Mom, I can't help myself. Well, don't do it anymore. Next day, Johnny comes home from school, sopping wet, completely wet. Mom says, what did you do? He says, I jumped in the pool again. But I told you yesterday. You remember telling me yesterday, telling you yesterday, you can't go swimming with all your clothes on from school. You're not allowed to do that. He said, I know, Mom, but the devil made me do it. How many of us blame the devil for some stuff, right? So 
She said, now, Johnny, I'm tired of you disobeying me. And if you really think the devil made you do it, then I'm going to teach you a scripture from the word of the Lord that says, get thee behind me, Satan. So if you feel tempted and you feel like the devil is about to make you do something, then you just tell him, get thee behind me, Satan. Okay, mom, I'll do it. Next day, Johnny comes home completely soaking wet. Mom looks at him, Johnny, I told you, don't go swimming in your school clothes. I'm sorry, Mom. Why'd you do it? I don't know. The devil made me do it. But did you declare the scripture, get thee behind me, Satan? He said, I sure did, Mom, and he pushed me right in. <laughs> Today we're going to speak about deliver us from evil. Deliver us from evil. We're going to look at the subject. For example, what can the devil make us do or what can't the devil make us do? And we're going to understand how God delivers us. And above all else, what has already been stirred up, what is already happening in this room, is going to continue on. And God is going to deliver you. Can I just remind you of how much God loves you? And that is why he wants to see you walk in freedom. That is why Jesus taught us to pray, deliver us from evil. God doesn't want you bound. He wants to set you free. So we look at this word, what does deliver us mean? What is this referring to? Of course, synonymous with the phrase to rescue someone. If you look up at the Greek, this original word, it has the same connotation, to be set free to be rescued, to be delivered from something. Uh, one, one connotation of it is to be, to be lifted up out of a situation, to, for chains to be broken off of a situation, to be separated from a situation that could be painful or harmful. And then we look at the word evil. The two main words we're looking at this, deliver us from evil. And of course, this can refer to evil things. The way the King James originally translated with just the word evil, it kind of gives this connotation of evil things, and Scripture supports that idea. Another translation of that same Greek word would actually assign a, a, a person to it, if you will, the evil one, which, of course, we know would be the devil or Satan. So we can see in Scripture how both of these things can apply in 1 Timothy 6.11 it says, but you, Timothy, are a man of God, so run from all these evil things. Run from it. Don't complain to God about how you're messed up in a bunch of evil things when you're running to it instead of from it. Ouch. Good morning. How you doing? Look at Joseph as an example. When he was being tempted by Potiphar's wife, he ran away from her. He didn't run to that. He didn't entertain it. He didn't sit at the bar and go, God, I don't know why I'm so tempted to drink. He didn't look at pornography and say, God, I'm so tempted to lust. He ran from those things. We are to run from those situations. We are supposed to flee those evil things. And so here we see in this scripture, evil as in the context of evil things, things that are evil. And it goes on to say, pursue righteousness and a godly life along with faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Then we see in James 4, 7, so humble yourselves before God, resist the devil. Now here we see this kind of more personified, evil personified in the devil. And then it says, and he will flee from you, including Johnny by the pool. He will flee from you. Resist the devil. Then 1 John 5.18 says, we know that God's children do not make a practice of sinning. Okay, now this is important in that prayer of Jesus where he says, lead us not into temptation. I don't make a practice of sinning. I don't live my life around sin. I don't entertain sin. I'm overcoming temptation. So then I can say, deliver me from evil. For God's son holds them securely and the evil one cannot touch them. So besides MC Hammer, you can say, can't touch this devil. Can't touch this. You don't even have to wear hammer pants to do it. 
Some of y'all don't have any idea what hammer pants are. They were tight at the bottom, but really baggy right here. So when you do the hammer dance, there's a lot of balloon action going on in the knee region, right? I had to be taught all these things culturally because I was a missionary's kid and I moved here to the United States to, to the Dallas area actually when I was 13. Walked into eighth grade and was completely lost. This was the times of vanilla ice, ice ice baby and all that stuff. Funny story, I don't know if you know this about him. He actually went to the same high school that I went to, R. L. Turner here in Carrollton. But he had made up this fictitious story about himself because he wanted to have more street cred that he was some preppy polo wearing kid that went to R. L. Turner whose dad had a, a car lot and he was actually a rich preppy kid that rode a motorcycle. So he made up this whole fictitious story about himself that he grew up in the streets of Miami in gangs. Completely not true. But anyway, I walked into all of that in society, right? And those and the pants, you had to have Z Cavarici pants. That was a kind of a version of the hammer pants. Some of y'all remember those Z Cavarici pants, and then Jabot and all these name brand pants that you had to have. I was a missionary kid, I didn't have any of those pants. And I had to like buy the, the off-brand version of them. And that didn't work. Kids did not accept that. But the devil can't touch us. So every time you hear that song, can't touch us. Just remember, that's you saying to the devil, can't touch us. Oh, he's going to try. But he can't touch us. Deliver us from evil. Who is our deliverer? Jesus. You know how Jesus starts off his ministry? Luke 4.18, reading one day from the synagogue. He reads a passage. See, when they would go to the synagogue every Saturday, they would, they would every Sabbath, better said, uh, every, every Sabbath day, they would, they would go in there and, and they would read a passage from the Old Testament. Of course, the New Testament wasn't, being, wasn't written yet. It was being written through the words of Jesus and through the Acts of the Apostles and all these other things. And so they would read a portion from the Old Testament and, and there's this passage in Isaiah that says these words and ironically, but yet not ironically, Jesus stands up that day in the synagogue and declares, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. It lists four incredible things, but we're going to look at two of them. It says, for he has anointed me to proclaim that the captives will be released, that the oppressed will be set free. Can I just tell you something? I have enough faith in my heart and I've seen God do enough things that I believe that that is going to happen or maybe already has happened in the last 30 minutes in this room. That is going to happen today in this place. All it requires is faith because our God is able and he is supernatural and there is nothing impossible for him. So get ready. If you feel like you are bound, if you feel like you're oppressed, God is about to set you free. Jesus said, that's why the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to do these things and the spirit of God is in this room today and he is about to do this in your heart. So get ready. Get ready. He's come to set you free. He's come to set you free today. Think about this. The Lord's Prayer ends where Jesus' ministry begins. Jesus ends saying, deliver us from evil. Jesus starts his ministry saying, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to set the captives free, to deliver you in Jesus' name. John 8, 36 declares, so if the Son sets you free, you are truly free. I'm not talking about some temporary situation. I'm not talking about some partial, halfway done freedom. I'm talking about completely and truly set free. I have heard the stories. I know the people that walk into the presence of God and lay down addictions that they have struggled with their entire life. I know of people who have been miraculously healed in their body in one instance in the presence of God. I saw the t-shirt of a missionary in the Philippines who when armed gunmen came into their meeting place and started shooting 
He stood there and the bullets literally just fell down to his feet. I saw the t-shirt with all the holes, yet he was completely alive and fine. So scared were the gunmen that they dropped their guns and ran the other direction. Can you imagine shooting a gun at someone and the bullets falling to the ground? Marvel Comics has nothing on that. We serve a supernatural God. And if he sets you free, you are completely and truly set free in Jesus' name. So how does he do this? I'll tell you the first thing he does. This is what's amazing. This is what really gets me fired up this morning. He breaks the chains. He breaks the chains that have kept you bound. This morning... God wants to break off of you any chains that have kept you bound. I don't care if it's been six months or if it has been 30 years. God wants to set you free today. He can do it. If he did it once, he can do it again. If he did it in others, he can do it in us. So get ready because God wants to break the chains off of you in Jesus' name. I want to remind you of a story. Acts 16, 25 says around midnight. Now I want you to notice what they're doing. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. See, a few minutes ago when we started worshiping, we sensed something was happening because our God's not deaf and he's not dead. And so he heard the worship of his children. And when that happens, supernatural things happen. There are some things that we can do in the natural that begin to activate the supernatural. And I want to tell you something, worshiping is one of those things. Because what starts off is just some really <clears throat> la 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 very mechanical natural thing as you start to sing, I don't care if you're a great singer or a horrible singer, when you make even a joyful noise unto the Lord, something starts to happen in the atmosphere. Things are changed. So look what happens. It says, while they were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. <laughs> Let me just tell you something. If you're in this room this morning and you went, whoa, what is going on in this church? And while everyone else was like worshiping and lifting their hands and stomping their feet and just like they couldn't contain themselves and you're just standing there watching and standing there listening, let me tell you something. You've heard about the negative thing of secondhand smoke. Well, I believe that there, you can make a biblical case for secondhand freedom because some other people got set free because other people were worshiping. See, your worship changes things. Your worship can change the atmosphere. Deliver us from evil. Deliver us from evil. We're not going to be selfish about it. It's not just God, deliver me. As long as I'm good, then I'm good. No, deliver us from evil. Deliver all of us, God. Deliver your church from evil. And when you and I start to worship, in corporate worship, things happen. Does that mean you shouldn't worship God alone? No. Does that mean that there's not powerful things that happen when you worship God all by yourself? No. Powerful things can happen there too. But there's something different and special that happens in corporate moments of worship. Now, I don't want to step on anybody's toes. And if you're watching us online, God bless you. We love you. We send you our, 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 our most heartfelt greetings. But if you live within a our radius of this church. Get here in person. Let me tell y'all something. I'm going to give you an example. I gave you this example one time in the middle of worship. This, this revelation just hit me. We were having a moment of worship like we did just now during church. And I had this thought. I've heard people say, you know, instead of buying tickets to go to the Cowboy game, Unless they're just amazing seats or maybe a luxury box. And even that, some people are like, ah, oh, I just feel so distant from the game in a luxury suite. Nah, forget it. 
I've heard people say, you know, I like to watch it on TV because I can see everything so much clearer. You get to see the replays and, and, and you get to hear the commentators and, and, you, and you get all that. So, you know, there's this debate about, well, if, unless the tickets are just really, really good, I, I think I just almost prefer to stay at home and watch it. I have to fight the traffic and, and all that and the lines. I just prefer to watch it from home. I've heard the same thing said about church. And it shows me in that moment whether you think you're a fan or you realize you're a player. See, fans might debate, ah, I think I want to go today because the tickets are good. The weather's just right. They're called fair weather fans. The team is playing well, so I'm going to go. But a player on the team would never decide, I don't think I'm going to show up on Sunday to the game because I don't want to have to fight the traffic. No, because he realizes that he's a player in the game. And when you and I come to worship together, yeah, we might have lights, and we might have microphones, and we might have a cool screen, and all those other things that just aid us and help us in the worship experience. But let me just tell you something. You didn't come to watch other people worship we came to gather together as the people of God to lift up our voice and to begin to worship Him. You're not a spectator. You're not a fan. You are in the game. You are someone who is a vital part of what's going to happen. And you can change the atmosphere when you begin to praise, just like Paul and Silas. So how does God deliver us? How does He set us free? Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. How many people were worshiping? Two. How many people got set free? Everybody. Deliver us from evil you didn't realize but your worship on a Sunday morning might be instrumental in setting someone else free because when the presence of God comes where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom and God's spirit comes to a place when his people gather and begin to lift up his name something changes in the atmosphere things change in the atmosphere and the result is people are delivered People get set free, starting with ourselves. How does he deliver us? He rescues us out of evil. Colossians 1.13 says, For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. 1 Peter 2.9 says that he has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. God sometimes will deliver you by getting you out of a situation, by picking you up and taking you out of there and setting you someplace else. He did this in Egypt. He delivered his people through a guy named Moses who was a foreshadowing, a type of what we would see in Jesus. Think about how many parallels you see between the story of Moses and Jesus. Think about their birth. Think about how they, they were trying to kill babies at the time of their birth and how God rescued and set them apart and saved them. Sometimes God will deliver you because he's going to get you out of a situation. If that's what he wants to do, if that's his will, praise God. If he wants to break the chains off, if he wants to get you out of a situation, praise God. Sometimes, though, he's going to rescue you in the middle of evil. When it's all around you, he can set you free. He can deliver you even in the midst of evil. You remember the story of this young guy named Daniel? Daniel? Actually, by the time this happened, he may have already been quite a bit older. This guy named Daniel in the Old Testament. The children of Israel were in captivity. He had a great relationship with the king. But there were some evil guys 
similar to the story of Esther, that had it out for God's chosen people. The Jewish people, from ancient times to modern times, always been persecuted because of the promises of God that were given unto them. And you and I, unless you're Jewish, you and I have been grafted in. We're a part of that too now for God's people. So you don't have to get Messianic Jew on me. You don't have to convert. All the promises of God, starting with Abraham, have now become ours. See, that's a miraculous thing that happens in Acts chapter 10, I believe, with Cornelius' conversion. The amazing ministry of this Jewish guy named Jesus with all his 12 disciples who were all Jews to a predominantly Jewish audience, maybe a few Samaritans who were considered a half-breed of the Jews, all of a sudden then becomes available to everybody of any ethnicity, of any background, because he's a light into the nations has been prophesied before his birth. But he can rescue you in the midst of of evil like he did with Daniel so they pass this law if you don't bow down then you're going to get thrown into this den of lions the king's heart was broken he's like this can't be they tricked me Daniel's a good guy I don't want this to happen but he was bound by law and Daniel gets thrown into the lion's den story tells us Daniel 6.20 that when the king got there he called out in anguish Daniel servant of the living God was your God whom you served so faithfully able to rescue you from the lions and if Daniel was a dramatic guy I bet he left the pregnant pause and maybe a little bit of dramatic awkward silence And probably when the king was just about to start sobbing, crying, and maybe the first tear had entered into his eye, he hears this voice, the voice of Daniel that says, long live the king. I think there's some foreshadowing there. Long live the king of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus, the great deliverer. Because, see, sometimes he can break the chains off of me. And sometimes he will rescue me out of the situation. But other times he'll rescue me in the middle of the situation. When all around me seem like their lions are about to tear my head off. Somehow, when I pray, deliver me from evil. Deliver us from evil. Then all of a sudden, these lions that are these known predators and killers... Their mouths are shut, and Daniel lives the whole night, and he's rescued, and he's saved by the power of the living God. We serve a supernatural God, and he is delivering us in Jesus' name. He will deliver you in Jesus' name. Sometimes he will deliver us by equipping us. Sometimes he just simply equips us with his grace to say, you know what, you're going to make it. He'll deliver you through that situation, through that thing that you've asked God, remove this from me. Like Paul who said, God, remove this thorn in my flesh, remove this. And Paul said, I realize though that God decided to deliver me through his grace. And he said, my grace is sufficient to you. So even in the midst of the hardship, even in the midst of the situation that you don't understand... And you don't understand why it hasn't been, you haven't been rescued out of it or even maybe rescued in it. God says, oh, I have another way to deliver you. I'll deliver you through my grace. That when no one else can understand, how in the world are you okay with everything that you're going through right now? You say, but for the grace of God, his grace is sufficient to me. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. He delivered me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. 
He delivers us through his grace, his grace that is sufficient to us. He also, though, can equip us by helping us to put on the full armor of God. Ephesians 6.13 says, Therefore put on every piece of God's armor, so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. I love that last part. It would have been enough in just the first part of that verse. But I love the fact it goes on to say, Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. He will deliver you by equipping you. God could have zapped Goliath right on the head. God could have used an ambush of 300 soldiers from the Israelite army to take him down. But God decided to equip a young man named David. Say, my grace is sufficient for you, David. And I'm going to deliver you and everybody else. Deliver us from evil. I'm going to deliver you, David, because I'm going to equip you. Now, in David's case, the armor wasn't the traditional armor. He tried that route and realized that wasn't going to work. You can't put on Saul's armor to win David's victories. It's a different story. And so David was equipped by God. He just took those stones and that slingshot and he took him down you know how God equipped David through training you know what David's training looked like it looked really different than his brother's training the whole reason David faced Goliath is because David was the water boy he had the insulting responsibility of taking food to his cool older brothers who got to be in the army and as a matter of fact, they ridiculed him once he got there. He was being bullied by his brothers. I have a feeling that after David took down Goliath and cut off his head with his sword, his brothers stopped bullying him. I would have. I don't know about you. <laughs> hey, David, sorry about all that bullying a few minutes ago. <laughs> I love you, buddy. You know how David was equipped? worship while his brothers might have been doing some pretty cool drills and doing their push-ups and sit-ups David was being responsible taking care of his father's sheep but we also know that David was a worshiper and sometimes being a shepherd is a lonely job so when you're all alone and there's nothing else to do you worship when you don't know what else to do you worship. And when you're obedient to your father's calling and to your father's will, you get some equipping going on that helps you to overcome lions and bears. Sounds like in a commercial for cereal of some kind. But David was equipped in those moments to defeat the lion. He wasn't afraid. There was no audience at that moment. See, sometimes we, we just want too much of a show. We want to make sure everybody else sees. But before God will give you public victories, you're going to have to win some private victories first. That's where integrity is built, when it's just about you and Him. And no one else is watching, and no one else is going to applaud you and go, Whoa! Way to go, man! Ten points! God equipped David through worship. That's why he wasn't afraid. It wasn't even in his skill. It wasn't even in his past experience. It's because David knew who his God was because he'd spent time with him. That's how we get delivered from evil. By being in the presence of our God. In his presence we are equipped. 
and then we can put on the full armor of God. It doesn't look like Saul's armor. It's things like the belt of truth and the helmet of salvation. Our feet shod with the gospel of peace. Just like Jesus, when the enemy comes, we take the sword of the spirit, the word of God, and we overcome. He delivers us through heaven. See, there is one connotation, there is one translation of the word to deliver us that means to actually pick up, like the way you would rescue a child out of burning flames and you would gather them up and transplant them and take them to another place. This is not a cop-out. This is ultimate victory. Heaven. I don't care what situation you're going through right now. God can and will deliver you. And if Jesus is the Lord of your life, if you have, are walking in, accord, in accordance to his word, in obedience to everything that he has taught us to do, then you and I have the promise of heaven. The ultimate deliverance the ultimate rescue. We know what heaven is like. The Bible tells us in Revelation 21 verse 4, He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. This week, during our 21 days of prayer, you'll see when you grab the sheet today for our prayer guide for this week, or when you look at it online, that one of the day's prayers is pretty long. Because we're going to pray for people like the Isaacs in India, missionaries that we support all around the world. And we're also going to pray for the persecuted church. And I think about people that today are giving their lives for the cause of Christ. And I think about that prayer. Maybe while they're about to face the firing squad. Maybe when death is three seconds away. And they say, deliver us from evil and our heavenly father welcomes in welcomes them into that place where there's no more pain and there's no more suffering and there are no more tears lead us not into temptation God but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you close your eyes right now? Worship is the key to deliverance. Worship brings the Spirit of the Lord and it sets us free. Father, send your spirit right now. As we worship you, Lord. As we lift our voice to you, God. As we lift our hands to the heavens where our help comes from.
Deliver us, oh God. Such a people free today, oh Lord. We need more of you. Let worship fill this room right now. And as our worship rises up, let the presence of Almighty God fall down. Fall on us today, oh Lord. Spirit of God, come to this place and set your people free. Set your people free today, oh God. We come against every attack of the enemy and we declare that we've been equipped, that the Spirit of God is in this place and the Spirit of God is in our hearts right now. We declare that you're alive and well. Supernatural, God. Set your people free today. Come on. Why don't you just begin to lift up your own worship to the Lord? I don't care if you're not a singer. Maybe you can just make some joyful noise. Maybe you can just say some words that come from your heart. I'm going to tell you something, church. That when we begin to worship this way, things change. And you will be set free and others around you will be set free. Deliver us from evil, oh God. Deliver us, set us free. Rescue us today, oh God. We declare that the Spirit of the Lord is upon us. He has anointed us to proclaim freedom to the captives right now in Jesus' name. habits because as quickly as they start, as quickly as they become completely powerless and meaningless to people's lives. But we will be sensitive to the move of God's Spirit. And I feel today in my heart that someone needs to take a step forward proclaiming that you are not bound. I have watched and sometimes noticed people in a church environment when the Spirit of God begins to move and begins to get stirred. I've seen two reactions. One is people do really crazy weird things that in no way glorify God. As a matter of fact, very selfishly, they will begin to convulse or shake or cry out in a way that brings all the attention off of God and onto them. And I'm just going to tell you something. We're not interested in that here today. But the other extreme that I've seen is that when God's presence begins to move, I've seen people freeze and not in a good way. And it shows me that there's something that has them bound. And today, God wants to set you free. So just the same way I told you that sometimes doing something in the natural like singing, that then becomes worship, that then brings the supernatural and moves the spirit of God into a room. There's also something powerful about taking a step forward. 
And not because this area right here is any more special than the back of the sanctuary or your house or your prayer closet, but because today, right now, in this moment and in this place, you're making a declaration, I am free. I am free to walk and to run into the presence of God. And nothing has me bound. There are no chains over me. I want you, if you need to make a declaration of freedom today in this place, would you walk out of your seat, come to the front, lift your hands towards the heavens saying, I have been set free. I am no longer bound. There are no chains over me. God is setting someone free right now by just taking those simple steps. Something is happening in their heart and in their life. It's the move of Almighty God. I think there's even more. If you're feeling that, that nudge and say, you know, maybe I should. Maybe there's something I'm supposed to do. Don't doubt it. Err on the side of coming. God wants to set you free. Can we all begin to lift up our voice right now? Lift our hands towards the heavens and declare that God has set us free. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Oh, Holy Spirit. Surrender. Lord, I 
someone's heart right now. And almost as special, God is doing something again. not into temptation but deliver us from evil you are free you are free because the Son has set you free because you've known the truth and the truth has set you free don't return don't put the handcuffs back on yourself. Don't wrap yourself back up in those chains. Now that you've known the truth, live in it, walk in it. You are free in Jesus' name. You are free in Jesus' name. He will deliver you. He will deliver you. Father, we declare freedom in this place. In Jesus' name. Can we one more time just lift up our hands towards the heavens? Lift up our voice and just say thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. There is joy in God's house. There is joy in the presence of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You have set us free. You have set us free. God is renewing strength right now in this house. Some of you would become weary. Weary in serving. Weary in your walk with God. Church had become a routine for you. And God is renewing your strength right now as you wait upon Him. The best days for the church in America are ahead of us. Like never before, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ will rise up and shine bright in the midst of darkness. And our church will be one of those churches. We will bring light to the darkness. We will bring freedom to the captives. We will bring healing to the sick. In Jesus' name, we declare it right now. If you're in agreement with me right now, can you just give the Lord a hand right now and say, yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Those of you who came forward right now, before you go back to your seats, I just want to declare one more time as I look at each and every one of you in the eyes and declare that you are free. You have been set free. You are free in Jesus' name. You are free in Jesus' name. God has delivered you. He has delivered you in Jesus' name. Over every person in this congregation, you are free in Jesus' name. Walk in the freedom of the Lord. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So walk according to the Spirit in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.